Good morning, everyone in New Zealand. Y muy buenas tardes a todos en Chile. Welcome to the first bilateral seminar brought to you by the Latin America Center of Asia Pacific Excellence, or LATAM CAPE, here in New Zealand, and the Center for International Studies of the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. Our particular greetings to the Ambassador of New Zealand to Chile, Her Excellency Linda Tipuni, the Ambassador of Chile to New Zealand, His Excellency Ignacio Llanos, his predecessor, His Excellency Isaro Torres, other members of government agencies in each country, and colleagues in the Latin American New Zealand Business Council. I'm Dr. Matthew Omar, Director of the Latin America CAPE. Our centre was created three years ago to prepare New Zealanders to do business and engage with Latin America. Based at Victoria University of Wellington and backed by a consortium that includes Auckland, Waikato and Otago universities, we deliver programs, resources, events and commission research that encourage businesses and students to include Latin America in their thinking and plans. We have joined our Chilean partners in organizing the seminar because we know there are opportunities in the trans-Pacific trade environment that could be better leveraged by our nation's exporters, including the growing view in Chile that New Zealand can be a development model for that country. Together, we have gathered this morning and this evening just the right people to discuss these things and introduce them to the, to the over 160 of you who have registered to attend this event. In a minute, we will explain how the, today's program will run. First, however, I'd like to advise registrants and attendees that we will be recording the session and taking snapshots, uh, screenshots of it, and more particularly, to ask our Chilean co-organizers and co-sponsors of this event to introduce themselves, who they are, and why they have partnered with us to bring this event to you. Maria Paz. Thank you very much, Matthew. Good morning, everyone in New Zealand. Y muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes a todos en Chile. I am uh, Maria Paz Fernandez, project manager at the Center of International, for International Studies of the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. And on behalf of the center, I would like to thank everyone who joined us today in our seminar. This opportunity is very important to be able to contribute to the dialogue on future bilateral economic relations. Having said that, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists. In first place, Dr. Alan Bollard. He is chair for Pacific Region Business at Victoria University of Wellington and former APEC executive director. Rodrigo Yanez, he is vice minister of international economic relations of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Chile. Claire Kelly, Assistant Secretary of Trade and Economic at New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and Germán González, Macroeconomic Coordinator and part of the Latin American Center for Economic and Social Policies at Catholic University. Thank you very much for being here uh, with, with us today. So, Jorge. Thank you, Maria Paz. Good morning in New Zealand. Good afternoon here in Chile. And as Matthew mentioned, since 2018, we have worked with Cape Latin American Center in strengthening ties between Chile and New Zealand. Both countries share similar characteristics. First, both are small, medium countries with robust institutional and relatively low level of corruption. Second, both are export-based economies. Third, both are open economies, according with the Global Competitiveness Report in, 2000, uh, in 2019, New Zealand is in the fourth place and Chile in the fifth place in their trade policies openness. Both are experiencing the growing role of China as their main trade partner. And both has been, have been active players in the new digital economy partnership agreement. Finally, New Zealand and Chile is in the most 
dynamic economic area in the Asia Pacific. In this morning, ProChile, a public agency of the government, presented a report of CSIRO and the Australian government called Global Trade and Investment Megatrends. Among others, the report mentions that digital transformation, the need to invest in supply chain resilience, and the complex geopolitical landscape, uh, landscape, along with the less political support for globalization, are key elements to understand the future on the international relations. So this seminar focused on a specific topic on the trade disruptions and how has been the response or how will be the response for New Zealand and Chile in terms of diversifying the risk and their exports. So I would like to start with Alan Bollard, the former executive director of APEC and also a member of faculty of the Wellington University to talk about that, Alan. How do you envision the future? What are the tendencies or trends that you have seen and that affects the future of trade? Gracias, Jorge. And Morena to our friends in New Zealand, Buenos Aires in Chile, to friends and ex-colleagues. Uh, it's a year, only a year, since the leaders meeting had to be cancelled in Santiago. And, and what a year we've had. It's been a year of living dangerously for everybody. Uh, like it or not, we've had another year of the US administration with its Make America Great policies. Uh, we've seen more tensions with the resurgent China. Those two powers have really dominated the headlines and dominated the economic implications for both Chile and New Zealand and the whole region. We've seen growing trade tensions, growing technology tensions spilled into financial tensions and political tensions uh, be between the two powers. and. Uh, of course, COVID has made everything more difficult and more acute in all of this. We now have health tensions between the two. We're shortly to expect to see some vaccine supply chain rollout, and no doubt there'll be some tensions in that also. Uh, of course, the Americas, North America and South America, have been very hard hit by the whole COVID uh, pandemic. And... Uh, at the same time, I guess in both countries, we're becoming more and more aware with perverse climatic events about the climate change issues that we've got ahead of us. So really, there's a lot of very big challenges. Uh, China has responded to the US tensions with more growth and with new policies. And as we go through this year, we've watched the IMF forecasts, which were for almost all the countries in the region to actually contract. Uh, and yet China has surprised us by it looks like they will have growth this year and more growth next year. And that's uh, given them a certain standing, at least economically, around the region. Uh, they're also responding with a new policy of dual circulation, which we think means a lot more self-sufficiency, but also they clearly intend to stay open to technology and other imports where it suits them. What we're seeing in supply chains, uh, I think, is particularly notable around the ASEAN region and actually Mexico as well, uh, as we see some movements of um, investment out of China, sometimes from Chinese, sometimes from Americans, sometimes from other countries into the ASEANs. They're revamping their supply chains. Uh, we're certainly seeing some final production uh, leaving China uh, and being done in the ASEANs on its way into the US. But we're also seeing Chinese supply chains changing as this goes on as well. Uh, I've been looking back, actually, uh, a couple of decades ago, a famous Argentinian economist, Raul Prebisch, but of course, he made his home to a large extent in Chile, he died in Santiago some years ago. Uh, Raul Prebisch was famous for having staff the first United Nations Regional Development Agency for Latin America in Santiago in the post-war years. And he's famous for the Prebish hypothesis, which basically says that 
uh, we are seeing, we saw at that stage, a lot of raw materials coming out of the south and going into northern industrial markets. And as those northern industrial markets continued to grow, uh, they actually managed to get a larger share of the value add out of that whole supply chain for their own domestic northern markets for various competitive reasons. And not very much of that occurred in southern markets, Chile, New Zealand, the same. And in fact, not much value add increase in those southern markets. And in a way, and we saw terms of trade not improving a lot as a result. In a way, that's still an issue for us. The Prebush hypothesis is still there. It applies to New Zealand, just like to Chile. So New Zealand and Chile, two small southern rationalist um, trading countries suffering the tyranny of distance, but sometimes also taking advantage from their more isolation. Similar insights. So we saw with Chile's 2019 APEC year, many of the issues that were coming up were ones that were very important for New Zealand as well. Uh, I used to run the um, Treasury Department in New Zealand, and we took quite a lot of interest in what Chile was doing on fiscal policy and some of the innovative things that it had in mind there. I also was governor of the Central Bank for a while in New Zealand, and there Chile used to send uh, delegations to the Central Bank in Wellington to look at what we were doing on monetary policy, and we took advice from you on your new note issues. Uh, so we've always been quite close. We've found quite a lot in common around policies. And of course, we all know that the CPTPP originated from the P4. Two of the key members of the P4 were New Zealand and Chile through all of this. So we're both concerned at these growing power tensions. We're both concerned at the potential for the increase in protection. Um, we're both concerned to look at what the new incoming president of the United States, Biden, might do in terms of protectionist policy. I don't think we're expecting that to change very significantly, um, but we certainly hope that it won't uh, continue to worsen. And we're both very aware of being in the throes of COVID vulnerability at the minute. The IMF forecast for Chile this year is a contraction of 6%. That's huge. For New Zealand, we're probably expecting something about half that. We're both expecting growth next year, but we will not get back to where we were before COVID started. And in fact, we've both got two or three years that we'll have to make up on as a result of all of this. Um, in the meantime, we're both keen on trade diversification. Of course, New Zealand's history was with its very great trade dependence on the United Kingdom before they went into the EU. Big irony now, we're seeing United Kingdom um, in urgent trade negotiations with New Zealand and with many other countries as it tries to stitch together arrangements when it leaves now that it's left the EU. But in our case, we're looking at much more China economy dependence and Chile as well, of course, some dependence on US markets in the past, now increasingly on China also. Uh, I think both of the countries are making quite slow progress in terms of trying to increase value add. And we're, at the, we're, we're the originator of supply chains with both our agricultural produce and Chile's um, mineral production. We come in right at the beginning of supply chains it has meant that it's harder for us to grab value add, and we've seen other countries take more advantage from doing that. I think that there's an argument, for example, that Singapore gets more value add out of New Zealand dairy product going into China than New Zealand does. So we've got some very serious issues, but they're very common issues in all of that. We are now both looking at new trade tech. So we're looking at... Uh, food security possibilities through supply chain management, tracking and tracing what that can do for both markets and originating countries, the whole range of electronic trade and the sorts of um, steps forward that we've managed to do during the COVID lockdowns as well in all of this. We've both got a real interest in climate change issues, sustainable production, uh, renewable energy, um, and we want to learn from where you go on green hydrogen, for example, we're both quite big on wind and solar. Uh, we're both interested in 
looking at how we get lower emissions in the future. We're both interested, I think, in looking at how wood fiber sophisticated developments might start to supplant some of the polymer uses, for example. We're both very interested in ocean issues and fishing and so on. Uh, next week, New Zealand takes over from Malaysia to host APEC, and you'll see a whole range of policy proposals that are there for the New Zealand year where we're looking for Chilean support, and many of them use the broad theme of how we all recover through the, from COVID as a way of changing and moving our focus for the vision for APEC moving forward. Thanks very much, Jorge, I'll stop at that point. Thank you, Alan. Before going to the Vice Minister of Trade uh, from Chile, I would uh, mention that participants can ask by our Q&A function if you have comments or questions for the panelists. Uh, Vice Minister, ah, there is, uh, Rodrigo Yanez. Uh, you have mentioned the importance of diversification from Chile, thinking of the future. How, how do you see the challenges and the opportunities for our trade policy in this new landscape and the policy responses associated with that? Thank you, Jorge, and thank you for inviting me, to, inviting me here to uh, this panel. Uh, I wish to uh, also uh, uh, greet uh, Dr. Bollard. It's, it's a pleasure to see you again, even if it's virtually, and, uh, and the rest of the panelists, of course. Um, in this sense, I think uh, the pandemic um, has uh, taught us also a lesson in terms of how important it is, on one hand, that uh, like-minded countries align and, and act coordinated together, uh, that how important is, in fact, that multilateral organizations actually work and deliver. Uh, there, there is this saying that I always use, it, which is when, when two elephants collide, it's, it's the grass that suffers. And in this case, uh, countries like New Zealand and, and Chile suffer the most uh, out of these situations. And we also resemble in terms of having among our top uh, trading partners, uh, countries uh, such as uh, China um, and, 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 and the US. So I think the first lesson is that we need to speed uh, up the process. And, uh, and, the, and the first of that is that when thinking in trade diversification, we, we need to go digital as well. And we need to think on, on trade 3.0. Uh, and you know, it's not just about uh, interconnected e-single windows. It must go beyond that. It must go on, on, on the, you know, the internet of rules. Um, uh, and, and, and other aspects of, 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 of trade 3.0, that the, like, I, like, like they call it. And, um, and, in, and in that uh, playing field, I think we need to think seriously about the rules of, of, of digital trade or trade in the, in, in, in the context of a digital economy. And that is not just restricted to trade of goods through virtual or electronic platforms, but uh, it needs to address also trade of digital goods itself. Um, and in that sense, I think one of the first uh, steps that we have made is uh, with signing the DEPA, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement with New Zealand and Singapore last June, uh, which will enter into force next uh, January. And, um, and also on other uh, trade fronts, such as the Pacific Alliance, where we will be launching a digital uh, regional uh, market on, on December, but also in other modernization processes that we are, we are having right now, such as uh, the South Korea FTA and also the EU. So the first is to think on, on that, on, on the rules that we need for, for that to flourish. And, what I'm saying is that diversification will have to go hand in hand with digital economy, with digital, with, with trading the digital economy era and, and services. And, uh, and our economies also are, you know, uh, natural resources dependent or commodities like, like us in, in Chile. Uh, but uh, we need to think on, on how uh, uh, it has also been an incredible uh, uh, source of talent, of services, of uh, very advanced human capital 
which we need to translate into exports. And for that, we need to address this discussion that I, that I mentioned on rules and, and at the different levels. I mentioned some at the plurilateral or bilateral sphere, but also at the WTO. And in this sense, also New Zealand and Canada have been acting jointly. Uh, we both belong to the Ottawa group where we also in the, in the, a few months ago have stressed in the political statements that we made the, the language around digital economy and on how we need uh, e-commerce uh, negotiations to advance uh, at the WTO. Um, and, and, and on diversification, I think uh, there's also um, a way to think uh, on, on, on uh, value chains, global value chains, the way that they are reshaping and how uh, services are also very an important component of value chains and how we need to, you know, again, touch, touching uh, again back on the topic of, of rules, how, what, how we need to take the way uh, so that our exporters have a level playing field, but we need to also uh, uh, increase uh, our participation in global value chains also when considering uh, uh, services and, and the way that they are increasingly uh, are becoming part of our of our exports. Um, of course, there is a component uh, when it comes to to geographical diversification, which is something that we are also uh, covering. We want to increase our presence in Southeast Asia. Uh, and we we look with great uh, attention the the recent RCEP signature. Um, but we're, we also have other avenues uh, that we are exploring, such as the ANSTA uh, agreement or, or that the ASEM Plus 2 agreement, where also New Zealand happens to be a, a strategic partner uh, with the Pacific Alliance, uh, associated members, where we hope that we can advance more than we have in the past few years, um, but also on, on, on other fronts, such as India, such as Eurasia, uh, the north of Africa, the, the Gulf countries, uh, all of uh, Africa, uh, in, in which are unexplored or uncharted waters for, for Chile and Chilean exporters. So I think the call after this pandemic is also for them to get out of uh, their comfort zone and, uh, and also join us in this effort of investing in uh, expanding our presence uh, to these other geographical uh, areas uh, where we either are not present or are way below our full potential given their imports. Um, but we have, as you, as you probably well know, a very strong FTA network. We have a good coverage of that. Um, but we need to do more in that unexplored part of, of, of the world. 95% of our exports go to a country uh, with whom we have an FTA. And uh, all of this part of the world either doesn't have uh, an FTA um, or, or we have agreements where, which are very, you know, uh, partial. So I think when thinking in diversification, we uh, are thinking very seriously in expanding the digital aspect of it, its rules, it, its infrastructure. Uh, and here I want to also mention the uh, Trans-Pacific Fiber Optics Cable that would connect us uh, with New Zealand and Australia, and from there uh, with the rest of Asia, uh, and also with the recent 5G network uh, leading process, which uh, will be crucial and instrumental to also uh, uh, give the technical and infrastructure tools that our exporters need to provide their services to sell their products worldwide. And in this endeavor, I think countries like New Zealand and Chile should, should uh, you know, keep acting and increasingly even more in the international and multilateral uh, sphere. Um, but also in terms of diversification, what we're doing geographically speaking in other parts uh, of, of the world. And uh, we're eager to uh, you know, re-identify uh, uh, opportunities with trading partners after this uh, recomposition of global value chains that we have seen, uh, not just because of the pandemic, but also starting from this decoupling from uh, between the US and China and the, and the trade tensions. Uh, we uh, are uh, uh, extremely exposed to, to, to international um, uh, markets. 57% um, uh, of our GDP is explained because of trade, um, but also 
it's interesting to mention that from the export side, um, it's, it's been also incredibly resilient uh, to this pandemic. And I would say, and also we, we, when we think on the social crisis in Chile in October last year, uh, also resilient to that. Uh, uh, from On a year-to-year -year basis, if you look at the 10 first months of this year compared to the last year, exports have uh, decreased only by 1.7%. Um, so I think uh, compared to other economic sectors uh, and the drop in our GDP, uh, this is a sector that is driving definitely the economic recovery and we need to reinforce it, make it more resilient and, and certainly more inclusive. Uh, we're also, I am extremely happy and proud to, to, to be a partner with, with New Zealand and, and countries like Canada um, uh, on issues like uh, the ETAG, which is linked to originally with the signature of the CPTPP, but that we have made into something else uh, with, with an agenda that has already delivered, for instance, the global trade and gender arrangement, which is also a, 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 a first of its kind, um, and, uh, and, and the way uh, to think seriously, and not just because of, of, of being a nice slogan, uh, the incorporation of, of SMEs, of women, uh, of our original uh, um, uh, indigenous people to trade. Um, and, and that, uh, I think, will be paramount to keep trade uh, uh, sustainable, uh, legitimate uh, among our citizenship. Um, and, 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 and that needs to drive also the agenda of, of the future of, of trade. We cannot have one without the other. I think they are very interconnected. Uh, the, the, this pandemic has shown a lot of weaknesses that we all have uh, in inclusion, uh, in, 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 in gaps that we have, and certainly one uh, huge gap that uh, arises from this pandemic is the digital one. And that is connected with SMEs, with uh, women-owned SMEs, where indigenous peoples, uh, uh, etc. So I think uh, on diversification, we need to uh, uh, think uh, at the same time, uh, like I said, in digital trade, in uh, this geographic, geographical also diversification, but at the same time with a very strong uh, uh, sense, uh, an urgent sense uh, of inclusion when it comes to, to trade, because we can no longer uh, afford and let uh, our citizens to, to, to um, um, not be fully aware of how connected their lives are with trade on a daily basis, that their jobs depend on it, that their you know, uh, uh, consumption depend on it, that our competitiveness also depend on it. Um, and that's, it's, a, it's a task that we must all all, uh, also and there as a, as a nation. So I think in that, uh, New Zealand is an extremely important partner and uh, I, we, I'm pretty sure that we will keep working very hard in the, during the next year, during the post-pandemic recovery phase. Thank you. Jorge. Thank you, Vice Minister. Uh, Claire, I'd like to, to discuss the New Zealand perspective. You also are an uh, export-based economy, meat, dairy products, like copper in our case. How can you uh, think about uh, the future of trade in New Zealand, given that uh, you are an exports-based economy and also the work you have made in the past, the trade for all work, in terms of, in order to, to put more uh, legitimacy to the, to the trade policy and, your, and the benefits of that? Thank you, Jorge. Um, good morning to our New Zealand audience and uh, muy buenas tardes a todos y todas in Chile. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I think Dr. Bollard and uh, Vice Minister Yanez have described the circumstances in which we all find ourselves, but particularly small export focused nations at present. So in response to your question, Jorge, I'm going to focus on diversification of, of risk in trade policy. And the risks that um, uh, we're thinking about in this regard are three, really, um, that we're facing as, as a small trading nation. 
The new one, of course, being the pandemic, the virus and um, the impact that it is having on our economy and the global economy in which we operate. Another risk that um, predated the, the virus, but is certainly um, exacerbated by it is the deterioration of the multilateral trade architecture, which has been such a, um, which has been the, the support network within which New Zealand has operated as a trading nation for the last 30 years. And the realization that that deterioration is due in part to the um, perception that as um, Vice Minister Yang has mentioned that rules for trade are outdated and that need to, that they're no longer fit for purpose and um, need to be reformed and made and modernized for um, the way trade functions today. Another risk that we are very co conscious of, which also the previous two speakers have mentioned, is that loss of social license around the idea of an ambitious trade policy, which um, arises from a number of things, but um, we see it in New Zealand arising from public concern about globalization and a sense that whole segments of our population um, have missed out on benefits, the benefits of trade. And that has been translated in various countries as we've seen in, into a rise in unilateralism and protectionism, um, including amongst some countries which have traditionally been the leaders of, um, of an ambitious trade project. In New Zealand's policy response to this situation has um, got a number of strands, but I'm gonna focus on, on one in particular, um, which is we call concerted open plurilateralism, which is um, the idea of, in a situation of turbulence and change, that we look for um, new and creative ways to take forward our trade policy and trade negotiation agenda with like-minded countries um, who are often smaller economies um, and that we look to break impasses and develop and drive new rules and new coalitions of interest through those smaller groups. And Chile, of course, is a very natural partner for New Zealand in this endeavor. Um, the most, um, the best example, which I think um, Dr. Ballard um, mentioned was the, um, was the P4, which, um, from a modest start has resulted in the CPTPP, which is a, um, uh, which we all know of in terms of a, of, of a piece of very critical trade architecture. Um, two particularly interesting um, examples, which have been mentioned um, in passing are the DEPA um, and the ITAG. And I'm just going to spend a little more time on those two um, those two processes. The Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, as um, Vice Minister Yanya has mentioned, is a um, plurilateral agreement with Chile, Singapore, and New Zealand. And it's quite groundbreaking in its way, um, covering a range of issues from trade facilitation to digital inclusion and emerging areas such as artificial intelligence. And it has really been an example of three small like-minded countries coming together to co-create new norms on this critically important area of digital trade. Um, it's been designed to be open and to grow in membership and scope over time. So we see it as being, um, having the potential to be quite influential in digital trade in, in um, a number of ways as a pathfinder that has innovative provisions for adoptions and other agreement, other contexts. Um, through direct accession by interested WTO members and um, transformation over time into a wider agreement as um, P4 transformed to CPTPP. Um, Vice Minister Yanni has mentioned that the DEPA will enter into force in um, January um, of next year. Um, in the meantime, there is a SME dialogue underway um, and a great deal of ongoing cooperation between our agencies. The deeper, uh, sorry, the ITAG, moving on to the ITAG, the um, uh, um, Inclusive Trade Action Agenda, that is another means through concerted open plurilateralism to address um, issues around 
um, a loss of social license for trade policy and um, concern about the narrow spread of benefits arising from the work that we do in the trade negotiation space. Um, uh, you referred in your introduction to New Zealand's trade for all agenda. This has been um, a trade policy direction that we have taken to review all our trade policy settings and ensure that they deliver for the widest possible um, spread of New Zealanders and that all New Zealanders can see the benefits for themselves, um, for their families, for their businesses, for um, the economy at large in New Zealand's trading um, trade policies and our connection to the rest of the world. It's been um, a large piece of work which involves a number of different New Zealand economic agencies. And um, we've really seen a lot of benefits from it. Um, the, the Inclusive Trade Action Group um, is our um, is work to, to bring that perspective into the plurilateral um, realm, if you like. And again, Chile and has been a very natural partner for New Zealand in taking that process forward. Um, uh, Vice Minister Yanya has talked about the, um, the uh, global trade and, ge and gender arrangement. Um, this is non -bind a non-binding arrangement rather than a binding agreement at this point. But um, it is a first in that it is um, really looking to focus the economic empowerment of women um, at the centre of the arrangement and to, um, to create that imperative for domestic policy settings that permit women to um, and women their businesses to uh, be able to integrate themselves very into the heart of, of our exporting sector, which um, currently in New Zealand anyway continues to be um, more male dominated. Um, we're at a very exciting stage in the evolution of the gender arrangement in that um, uh, the three partners, Chile, um, Canada and New Zealand have identified a range of other countries we want to take this idea to and, and, and begin discussions with. Um, so that process is getting underway at the moment. And looking ahead, um, the ITAG um, is looking to explore um, indigenous um, trade um, as a next um, issue of focus. Um, where all the three countries are, all have um, strong um, indigenous economies. Um, in New Zealand, the Māori economy has a very um, substantial asset base in primary production. And um, there is a, a very strong and well-formed Māori economy which looks to the world. Um, we want to um, explore ways through the ITAG of um, of advancing that, of supporting and um, facilitating our indigenous um, communities to um, to work between themselves and to to drive their economies for the, the betterment of their communities. So, from the diversification perspective, we're looking at um, concerted plural, open plurilateralism as another way of of driving diversification of risk diversification of partnership and um, giving, having through um, that connection with our like-minded countries such as Chile, um, coming up with some of the answers and the solutions to these um, problems that are besetting our global trade environment. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Claire, uh, for your insights. Herman, you have conducted a research on export diversification comparing Chile with Australia and New Zealand. And, and you highlighted two ways. One was in general terms, I mean, one was promoting diversification within the natural resources and the other one promoting services exports. Can you deepen on your, on your study and how do you see the Chilean and New Zealand projection on diversification. Of course, Jorge, thank you very much. 
uh, for the invitation to share my view, our view about the, uh, this topic um, related to Chilean export. Um, well, uh, I would like to start saying that uh, uh, some economists and risk rating agencies usually uh, highlight that our economy is not diversified enough. And of course, it's true because um, the Chilean external sector is very dependent on copper export. About 50% of our export are copper or mining products. But uh, they generally go on and to say that the lack of diversification is likely to be a restriction for the development of the economy. The second step is first, uh, lack of diversification Second step is the uh, a restriction for the development of the economy. Um, this topic is particularly relevant right now in Chile because as maybe you know, uh, some weeks ago, the people in Chile voted in favor of writing a new constitution. Um, in this context, some people believe that it is an opportunity for change on several fronts, including changes to our economic model in which the openness to the international trade and the export of natural resources are very relevant, are, are, are important points uh, of our uh, strategy of development. Well, um, as, as you say, Jorge, in a, in a recent working paper, we wrote with Felipe Larraín, former Chilean Minister of Finance, and Oscar Perillo, a PhD student in London, we tried to give an answer to the question of the lack of diversification of our economy and the potential effect of that on the development of the country. And we do that making a comparison with Australia and New Zealand. Um, I would like to say that we uh, review the diversification in terms of product, okay? Not in terms of market, for example, or risk uh, as uh, the previous panelists uh, talk. I think there is different dimension of, of that topic. We talk, we review the topic of the products. Well, uh, first in our, in our study, we, we first uh, uh, ask why we should compare with the Chilean economy with Australia and New Zealand instead of other developed countries like Singapore or South Korea, for example. The, the first part of our study uh, talk about this topic. Well, um, in our opinion, the comparison uh, between Chile, Australia, and New Zealand is appropriate across at least four dimensions. First, um, because the three countries are small open economies, okay? Uh, second, because Australia and New Zealand became developed over a more recent period uh, of time compared with other countries. Uh, in third place, because um, Australia and New Zealand have structural similarities with Chile, like the macroeconomic policy framework, uh, maybe as you know, uh, the three countries have inflation targeting, uh, exchange rate, floating exchange rate, fiscal rule. Um, also because their commercial and financial openness, the wealth of natural resources, of course, and their geographical distance from the rest of the world uh, are a common characteristic between these three countries. And for um, when Australia and New Zealand had an income equivalent to what Chile has today, they were more similar to us than other developed countries. Well, so in the first, in the first uh, part of our study, we uh, answered this question. We, have, uh, we put a lot of information and evidence uh, on, on, on that uh, question. And the second part of the study, we, um, we, we make the, the following. We use disaggregated, very disaggregated export data uh, to have from 1,000 to 5,000 lines of export of product. And we constructed different concentration measures of export. Uh, we construct the tail index, the Gini index, and the Herfindahl index. Maybe you know uh, that's index because they usually are used as measures of income distribution, the, the Gini index, uh, or market concentration like the Herfindahl index. But we used that indicator for, uh, for export, for, for, for products that we uh, in Chile and Australia and New Zealand export. Um, I would like to, to briefly uh, tell you about our uh, results. Uh, 
First, uh, our first result is the following. Chile has a level of export concentration equivalent to or lower than Australia, okay? Using the three indicators that I mentioned. But our concentration is higher than that of New Zealand, okay? Second conclusion is the following. The current level of concentration of our products in Chile remains similar to that of 1990, okay? Um, the change has very, very low. And the third conclusion is Australia and New Zealand have grown their export concentration over time, have grown their export concentration. And, they, and this is related especially to the traditional sector, okay? So we observe that the, the concentration of export in Australia and also in New Zealand have increased, increased over time and especially in traditional export. Um, let, me, let me take a couple of more minutes to talk more specifically about Chile and New Zealand um, and our conclusions. Well, New Zealand is usually used as a development reference for Chile, in part, in our opinion, because in 1994, it exceeded the per capita GDP of our country. So it, it's an even closer experience than Australia because Australia exceeded our per capita GDP in 1981. Uh, so this is one of uh, uh, the main points. The second point is that New Zealand is also a smaller economy than Australia. Uh, New Zealand, uh, similar uh, uh, than Chile, we represent around 0.3% of world GDP. We are a very small, very small economy. Now, when we're analyzing New Zealand export from when it had an income level equivalent to that of Chile, we can see New Zealand traditional export grew from 27% to 34% of total export, while its manufactured export decreased from 25% to 16% of total export. Well, for us, this is a relevant topic because in the, in the internal discussion, political and economic discussion, uh, a lot of people say that Chile should increase their production and export of uh, manufacturing export. Um, but the experience of, of New Zealand is not in that direction. Our analysis reaffirms that New Zealand economic development did not occur and maybe uh, our panelists can uh, confirm or not uh, our conclusion, but our analysis shows that uh, the New Zealand economic development did not occur as traditional export were displaced by more sophisticated products, but instead its economic advance was in parallel with a specialization process in its traditional dairy and meat products, the export where it had comparative advantage. So we come back to the uh, beginning of the economy. So the, the countries have to export uh, products where they have comparative advantage. In, in the case of Australia and New Zealand, uh, uh, dairy and uh, in, in, the, in the case of New Zealand, dairy and meat products, in the case of Australia or Chile, uh, mining products especially. Um, and to wrap up then, the cases of Australia and New Zealand suggest that diversification uh, of course, in terms of products, uh, I, I, I'm talking about products. Um, diversification into value added or manufactured product is not a necessary condition for economic development. It's not a necessary condition. And this is in line with the economic evidence that finds that export diversification does not have a causal effect on the income level of a country. Instead, the evidence suggests that trade policy should primarily focus on export promotion and not on diversification itself. Thus, as a possible development strategy for Chile in, in our proposal, uh, an option is to strengthen export development without bias, even if this leads to a greater share of traditional export. Uh, well, thank you very much um, for your attention. Maybe in, 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 in the next, uh, intervention, I could talk more about our, our study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herman. The study is available at the Center for Public Studies uh, in Chile. You can access by internet because some participants have asked about the, the report, the working paper. Dr. Bollard, uh, 
Claire mentioned uh, the concept of diversification of risks. You have worked for a long time for APEC, and I would ask you, for countries like New Zealand and Chile, with at least high reliance on China or growing reliance on China, what are the strategies or alternative you see to diversify the risk, given the fact that the strategic confrontation between United States and China actually affects New Zealand and, and Chile? How do you see the, the way to diversify the risk? Well, thank you, Jorge and Herman. Very interesting study, very interesting conclusions. Uh, New Zealand's choice um, to move out of manufacturing was particularly because of the fact that we had some extremely inefficient import protection for very small market and very high unit costs. So yes, in the 1980s, we reduced our manufacturing sector by about a third. And what has happened is we've continued to grow traditional exports. That wasn't particularly a policy choice. That's pretty much um, been comparative advantage showing through and leading to more development, as Herman said, in dairy, in meat production, and in some other agricultural, horticultural, um, and particularly forest um, production as well. And uh, that growth has been driven out of Chinese demand and other East Asian demand particularly. For us in this part of the world, we've seen the growth of quite sophisticated regional and local supply chains around Southeast Asia. But the main part of what New Zealand's doing is still shipping large tons of um, product offshore. And we, we um, I think, uh, don't have so much a problem about product diversification, but we do have a question about product intensification where we're not getting a lot of value. And in some cases, it's clearly gone backwards in the uh, area of forestry, which is again, as a sector with Pinus radiata that we share with Chile, uh, we have, are finding a lot less domestic value add. By far our biggest export now is simply um, chopping down trees and shipping out logs. They're going to China where the huge volume that they're uh, managed to aggregate means that they've got very sophisticated production and they're using sawmilling arrangements that get a much higher return out of the out of the wood of the tree than we've been able to do. And we've got to really work out um, how much we can, can improve our domestic value added. We are um, growing dependence on China. Actually, we look to Australia there because Australia is very dependent on Australia on the Chinese market. And of course, has suffered quite a lot from tension with regard to China and from pressure back from China on Australia, um, limiting some of their quite key uh, exports. And that is making us just think about uh, market diversification as well as product diversification. But ultimately, a lot of what we export will have some Chinese content, even if it's not final Chinese market. Um, much of our product, for example, dairying, um, may start off as milk powder in New Zealand, but can end up as quite complex and sophisticated pharmaceuticals in various markets in East Asia or North America for that matter as well. Thank you, uh, Alan. Vice Minister Yanis, um, we, we know that unfortunately the TPP is still pending the Congress approval. And this raised a question about the narrative of trade. How can you explain deeper how uh, the work you are uh, leading about the narrative of, tr of trade to show better or communicate better the benefits associated with the interconnected economies and the trade from Chile? Well, I think that there's an important communicational effort in, in doing some stakeholder management and take it to a, a, a new a new net, a new level. Um, like I was, was mentioning, uh, 2.8 million jobs in Chile are directly or indirectly related to trade, and um, and also the, the participation 
of uh, of SMEs uh, in in our uh, added value exports uh, or value added exports it's uh, it's very important and increasing in numbers so i think the first is is to uh, make chileans uh, more graphic the way they involve or are involved with trade um, how thousands of SMEs uh, rely on, on, on being suppliers of export companies, on the jobs that I was mentioning, uh, and others. And, and I think in that sense also it's important this like mandate exercise on, on, on a common approach to trade. What we did with the, with the CPTPP was precisely in the context of the ETAC um, to uh, assess uh, uh, the impact of the agreement. And this is something that we do both for the first time in an FTA from, from different perspectives, mainly related to inclusion and, and social and, and regional economic development, environmental issues. And, and, and we need to be more accountable in terms of the performance of the agreements, the impacts in issues uh, that are not specifically you know, to, to, to trade in goods related. Um, and uh, and I think that, that trade is well. It's not the the, the final goal. It's a tool, um, but uh, but I think a very important tool to be successful in this new dynamic that we're facing, and and and, and in the new economy that that we know it's it's right there. Uh, so. So I think um, uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's it's a, a reality sort of check what happened with the CPTPP, which is not strange uh, or unique to Chile only. Uh, trade is uh, something that is also at the at the at the at the you know top of mind issues in in public discussions uh, and globalization and this deglobalization. Uh, exercise on protectionism, on, on, on all of that, that it's over the table these days. Um, but uh, it's an opportunity also to uh, drive the attention of the people around uh, trade. And, and, and I think we, we're also paying a price of making it uh, an assumption, like uh, taking it for granted and not really explaining how important it is uh, and it will be for our economic recovery and 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 uh, and, and well-being, so um, that is something that we are working and and that we are increasingly uh, in, uh, stressing with New Zealand and Canada in the context of ETAC. Now we are uh, uh, working on the launch of uh, of a trade and indigenous people uh, also uh, agreement, which, like Claire said, uh, there are no ban. There are no binding, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they drive a lot of, 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 of virtuous uh, uh, movements around these issues. Um, and this is a, a way that we will keep working. We made women at the center, uh, also one of the top priorities of our APEC year. We uh, were able to, to agree on the La Serena roadmap, which, which was mentioned by the leaders in the past summit. We are launching the same in the Pacific Alliance next December. And, and we will keep working on SMEs, digitiz digitization of SMEs, um, and, and, and like I said earlier, paving you know the, the rule book uh, that they need uh, so that trade can be also more uh, uh, you know coming to flesh for people and, and the tool also to to, to prosper and, and really uh, lower barriers. Uh, I think uh, this revolution of trade uh, and digitalization in this past uh, uh, months. Uh, also, I think we need to turn it into an opportunity because uh, it's, it's a fact that our SMEs and, and people, the way they get more tools to, to go digital, um, the more democratic trade uh, involves and, uh, and they, they can deal with their uh, uh, consumers in the other sub part of the world, or, or you know, their importers, and it makes trade more efficient, uh, uh, faster, uh, and at the end of the day, it's an incredibly powerful tool to democratize also uh, trade. And I think that's the 
the challenge, but the, the opportunity that, it, that we want to grasp uh, uh, from, from, from now on. Thank you, Vice Minister. Claire, one of the purposes of this activity is to learn each other between Chile and, and New Zealand. And, and, and you mentioned two important topics for my perspective. The first is you can go deeper on the social alliance license, a uh, social license concept. And the other, what is the strategies that you are uh, engaging stakeholders in this whole process of, of thinking about your trade policy and more inclusive and more open? Thank you, Jorge, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I'll answer the second one first. Um, around how we've changed our engagement. Um, New Zealand for many, many years had, um, had a, uh, a bilateral, um, or we had, a, we had a trade policy that was accepted um, by all our political parties. Um, and um, that was very severely tested during the negotiation of the TPP. Um, and we saw for the first time a, an end to, um, or a severe fracture in, in, in a bipartisan approach to our trade policy. And that for um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade was a, a really strong indication that um, there was more that we needed to do in terms of telling the story, just as Rodrigo has outlined and, and making it, um, making it more obvious to people, uh, to New Zealanders, what stake they had in our trade policy and um, in the outcome of our trade negotiations. So really, we intensified what we did. We've created a specific standalone unit as part of our um, trade and economic group. And we're extremely active um, in, uh, in our consultation practice. We listen a lot more than we used to to what um, SMEs, exporters, importers, what people want to tell us about what they want to see in New Zealand's trade policy. And of course, um, uh, the government's trade for all agenda has, has really driven us in that um, and set this very high benchmark for us um, to, uh, uh, the beginning of the last government um, as a new direction in trade policy, um, a whole process was run around the trade for all agenda, which started with quite a, a, a big consultation process. We had an online consultation, we had traditional town hall meetings um, in which we asked New Zealanders what they wanted from their trade policy and what their concerns were about it. Um, there was then a board appointed called the Trade for All Advisory Board, which was a, um, a, minister, a board that reported directly to the Minister for Trade and Export Growth and uh, was 25, made of 25 representatives from all over the New Zealand economy, really representing a huge diversity of interests. Um, and all, all, par all um, parts of the spectrum of perspectives around trade and its value to our economy. And that um, board spent a year deliberating in, in real detail about the nuts and bolts of our trade policy and what our objectives should be with our, for our trade connection with the world. The board delivered its report to government in November of last year and um, in doing so delivered 53 recommendations for how our trade policy should evolve. And the government made its response to that um, report in March of this year and um, basically undertook to implement all those recommendations. So we have this very detailed blueprint roadmap um, about uh, what New Zealanders expect from us as, as officials in delivering our trade policy. And that guides us in our, um, in our intensified um, information exchange in, um, in talking to exporters and everybody with an interest in the trade area. And um, I just in terms of um, what we learn from others in that regard, Chile has been a real, um, has shown real leadership, I think, particularly in respect of the trade and gender um, initiative. Um, 
uh, it has concluded several chapters in or chapters in several trade negotiations. Uh, I think in the Chile Agreement and in the Europe um, FTA on uh, gender. So we were very keen to partner with Chile in the ITAG process because we knew we had a lot to learn from Chile in terms of of um, taking our own work forward in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Herman, one of the conclusions uh, of your study is that rather than reshaping the model of Chilean economy is taking advantage of the opportunities in the natural resources sector or in the services one. What are the recommendations or the policy recommendations that you can share with the audience based on your research? Okay, thank you. Well, um, as you know, Jorge, we conclude in our study that um, product diversification is not a necessary condition for economic development uh, by, based on the experience of Australia and New Zealand. Um, however, in our opinion, efforts should be put into deepening and enabling international trade. So we, uh, we agree that uh, we need to continue deepening our uh, network of uh, markets around the world. Um, in terms of uh, public policies, uh, at the end of our uh, study, uh, we recognize that uh, they have a role to play. Um, and we propose uh, also from the, our experience in the Ministry of Finance, uh, two additional ways to advance in Chile. Um, one option, one option refers to promoting export diversification within each product sector. Um, in our opinion, this will strengthen the sector that we have comparative advantage. So in line with the conclusion of, of our study, uh, we uh, state that uh, we, we can increase our diversification within the, the, for example, the agricultural or the mining sector. Um, at the same time, this could permit us to increase the variety of export, the number of products that we export. Uh, but again, uh, export where we have a comparative advantage, no, 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 no other products. Um, there exists a, a, a working paper right by uh, Felipe Larraín and Oscar Pereyo at the beginning of this year, where they show that um, this type of diversification, so within a, a sector particular, um, they, they, they talk about the natural resources sector, can contribute to GDP growth. So we have some evidence in that, in that sense. And the other option, option that we propose is to take advantage of Chile's international, sorry, institutional and economic strengths, especially compared with the rest of Latin America, and to diversify towards the export of services. Um, we uh, especially uh, propose uh, to advance in the line of uh, increase the export of financial services. We, we think that uh, Chile has a big opportunity uh, in terms of Latin America to convert in a global or at least regional financial center. Um, Chile have taken some steps in that direction in the past, but we still have plenty of room to grow in terms of services exports, especially financial services, I told you, uh, Jorge, thank you very much. Thank you, Herman. We have two questions from the director of Cape Latin American Center. Matthew, please. Thank you, Jorge. Um, these questions are actually to all four uh, panelists, um, and they're really, driven by the fact that we have a lot of exporters who have participated, who are participating in this event. The policy makers and the academics of both countries uh, are aware of the need to collaborate and the advantages of collaborating. How can we um, raise awareness among the business communities and the exporters of both nations of the advantages of collaboration? And the fact that, the, that this collaboration is, is continuing, this dialogue is going. And related to that, what stops more collaboration between our exporters and diversifying markets? 
Thank you. Maybe in the same order, first, uh, Dr. Bola. Sure, well, interesting question. And um, I think this comes back to the really the root of the relationship between New Zealand and Chile. We're quite similar and we like cooperating, but we also compete. And if you go back through a couple of decades with New Zealand um, development of Pinus radiata and kiwi fruit, uh, for example, um, apples, um, salmon, dairying, uh, these were all areas we competed quite intensely with Chile. Um, and in some cases, we tried investing, and in some cases did successfully invest in Chile to get common approaches. Uh, when it comes down to it, we've, got, we've both got these natural resources. We are both quite distant from markets, and neither of us is a big source of domestic savings. Mm. And so consequently, we've got the same sort of factors and the same sort of challenges, good reasons for cooperation, but actually, from an economic point of view, uh, New, Zealand, um, uh, people, New Zealand exporters in this area don't go to Chile looking for capital markets, for example, although maybe if what Herman says happens in a decade or so, they might. But um, we're, 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 there's a strong competition going on as well as a cooperation. And I think that's always going to be in the back of the minds of a, a lot of business people. Thank you. Vice Minister? Or Vice Minister is here, or maybe Claire? You can, you can start, Claire. Maybe to Jorge. Um, I wonder also if there's an issue, I mean, I think what Dr. Ballard, Ballard said is very pertinent. I also wonder if there's an issue of bandwidth, given that um, as we've, uh, as we've acknowledged, a lot of the exporters in both countries are small, me small medium exporters and even um, MISMEs, micro, small, medium enterprises. Um, there simply may not be a great deal of um, spare capacity within um, some of our exporters to think about collaboration, if, if, if by collaboration we're talking about together in third markets. I mean, I would note that in respect of New Zealand and Chile, there is there has been quite a degree of that collaboration, for example, between Fonterra and Soprole in terms of um, joint initiatives, investment, and then um, expansion into third markets. So, I mean, I think business doesn't really need to be told much from government about the benefits of collaboration. It's very natural for our exporters to seek out partners um, and, and where their um, and those opportunities have been taken in the past. I suppose what what um, what we can do in the future is look to create more platforms for um, for connecting. For example, um, uh, in the um, doing what we can to encourage um, our businesses to be able to 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 get to know each other. Um, for example, um, as part of New Zealand's trade, uh, trade recovery strategy in re response to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, um, we are, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade is, is, is intensifying its efforts to um, act on behalf of exporters in their markets and um, it, it amplify their voice in key markets. And... Um, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, our um, uh, economic development and trade promotion agency is doubling its offer to New Zealand companies to give them that ability to connect with, um, with um, counterparts in other markets. So I think we'll see a lot of development in this area in the next few years. Sorry, thank you, Claire. Vice Minister. Oh, we're good. Thank you, Jorge. Um, no, I think, um, well, it's, it's true what Dr. <clears throat> Bollard said, says in terms of uh, how we compete, but that makes us also to face the same challenges. So uh, it's extremely important that we have this fine tuning from the trade perspective with New Zealand and, and how we face, and this is something that we do with, with, with trade in, in New Zealand on, on facing common challenges in, in, in other markets. 
Um, we learn from their experience. Other occasions in New Zealand uh, learn from ours. And when we, when we talk about uh, inclusive trade, uh, we have an agenda that I think benefits uh, us all uh, from that uh, perspective as well. Um, now, when, when, when thinking in how we could further uh, connect, uh, interconnect uh, our uh, economies, um, well, I think uh, some barriers relate, for instance, on the trade perspective, I think from uh, on the infrastructure side, I think the, the cable will be a, a game changer, the fiber optics cable, when, when thinking in our small and medium enterprises that provide high technology services, for instance, they need a good quality of connection. And that today does not exist when facing issues such as, you know, EOT and and, and artificial intelligence, etc. And that's really important. Um, but also from the logistics perspective, uh, uh, one issue we have is that we don't have very frequent lines, right? In, 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 in our uh, uh, ships, our markets are small. Uh, so our trade goes mainly uh, through uh, airplanes uh, or it uses another, uh, uh, you know, uh, shipping line that is more frequent uh, with Asia. Or, 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 South, or, 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 or Southeast Asia and Oceania. And uh, I think we need to do an exercise where we can think together or jointly like we do with other countries in the region uh, in, uh, in, uh, in global or regional uh, value chains and see how we could you know, uh, improve and, 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 and reinforce that uh, collaboration between us and that is about connecting our business communities, um, our trade promotion agencies. Uh, also, we need to, you know, do uh, an, an, an exercise with numbers, with data, um, and and in fact, we we sent uh, someone from our research team to uh, to the ministry in New Zealand to learn more about uh, the way uh, New Zealand approaches from a, 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 a quantitative perspective. Um, in, in, in thinking in, in how they model agreements. Um, and I think we, we should expand that uh, precisely uh, to also adapt to these new challenges that we see after uh, this pandemic. Um, so, but uh, I think uh, regardless of not being at first hand very uh, natural for someone that is not closely related with, with trade issues between Chile and New Zealand, uh, it's extremely, it's one of maybe one of our, of the most beneficial relations that we have from the trade perspective, regardless of not having actual, you know, uh, much trade uh, between uh, our countries, but, but actually it's incredibly um, uh, important uh, how we uh, provide feedback and we benefit from that when facing challenges that because of, of, of resembling each other, um, we, we, we also face uh, on, the, on the challenges side. Thank you, Vice Minister. Herman, would you like to add something to these two questions? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I, I think, well, I, I was thinking in, in the answer, but really um, New Zealand is a country that we admire in Chile. Uh, we, we look at New Zealand as, a, as an example to follow. Um, I think we have to observe a lot of uh, things from New Zealand, from the experience of New Zealand. Um, I, I write three ideas. First, in terms of knowledge and education. So I think education, I think um, we have a gap uh, in quality of education, education in different sectors, in engineering, um, technical education that we can uh, absorb a lot from the experience of, of, of New Zealand. Um, the second one is the, I, I think it's necessary for, for, for the trade, for trade, for, export, for exportation, is modern, modernization of the state. We, we, we have a, a problem with, the, with our state because it's very low, it's very old. And the pandemic uh, showed that we don't have a, a modern state uh, that we need for um, give uh, the the help to the people or or to 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 our development. We need an, we need we need a modernization of the state. I think uh, New Zealand is uh, is a very well example of that. Um, 
and of course, we usually are looking at uh, New Zealand because the quality of their public policies. And I think um, since the, the, last, uh, the last year, we are, we are um, um, with, with some problems in social terms with, with a lot of uh, social uh, unrest and mobilizations. So we are reviewing our constitution, our uh, way to make public policies. And I think that uh, we need to recover our uh, social stability uh, for to uh, advance to the process of development. And I think we can learn a lot of the experience in, of New Zealand and we need uh, the experience uh, and the collaboration in that topics. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Kerman. Uh, the vice minister uh, has to leave because he has a meeting with the president. Maybe Rodrigo, if you, you want to say bye-bye or, or just a one minute message. Oh, thank you. No, thank you for the invitation. I think this, this uh, opportunities give us a chance to, 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 to think on, on the future. Um, I think the, the work uh, that was also explained by Herman and, uh, and the CLAPES uh, U, uh, UC University, it's, it's extremely important and insightful uh, when uh, you know, double clicking on what we need to do to, to further expand opportunities because uh, uh, it's more you know, it, it, it's a bit more tricky maybe than, uh, than with other trading partners. But I think um, um, we, we, we must think, and not just on, on, on our respective markets, which uh, are, are pretty small, but on, on, on how to, to go to third, you know, uh, uh, markets. Uh, I think that is something that we should increasingly do. There is an, 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 an important uh, also experience, I think, in, in, in New Zealand investment in that sense here. But I think, especially when we think on, on, on these other uh, services uh, uh, side, I think we could really uh, empower each other as, as we have similar industries, we have a similar um, uh, export offer. Uh, and I think uh, in this new front of, of trade, uh, in, in the digital era, I think we, we, we must, you know, uh, uh, crack uh, the puzzle in, in terms of expanding our trade. Um, as I am pretty sure that uh, there are opportunities there to, to, to be taken. So thank you, everyone. And it's a pleasure to uh, uh, participate here. Thank you, Claire. And, and, and please uh, uh, cheers All to more. Vangelis and Dr. Bollard and uh, Matthew and Herman. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Vice Minister. We are almost on time, but we have one minute, final one, last minute per panelist, Dr. Bollard, Claire, and Herman. Dr. Bollard. Oh, well, this, I think this has been really interesting, um, but I think as Claire was saying, from New Zealand's point of view, uh, there's a bit of a tendency to look north, not look east, if you're an exporter. And that's because that's where the markets are. And Matthew knows that very well because he's running the Latin American Center for Asia Pacific Excellence. We have a North Asia one and a Southeast Asia one, and they find it a little bit easier to get the attention of New Zealand exporters. But that's something we're all working on. And I think we've learned from this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bollard. Claire? Just really to echo the same thought. Um, I think, uh, New Ze the government has en encouraged New Zealand exporters to, to look at focus on the um, Asia part of the Asia Pacific market for the last 30 years. And that's been a very successful endeavor. And um, our connections, our linkages, our trade with, um, with Asia is, is, has really um, developed as a result. Um, there are opportunities, so many opportunities with Latin American partners, with Chile, with Mexico and every country in between, and um, we're in—I think we're in a—we're in a good space through the CPTPP, through um, our um, process of becoming a can of a, becoming an associate state for the Pacific Alliance, through our very close col collaboration with Chile and other partners in the World Trade Organization, and through our APEC year, our host year of APEC next year to um, really highlight the opportunities that um, our exporters on each side of the Pacific have in each other's markets and in third markets. 
Thank you, Claire. Herman. Well, um, I would like to say that uh, our study shows that the best option is for Chile, at least, is continuing doing what we know how to do. That is um, what we have a comparative advantage. Uh, it includes, uh, of course, not, 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 not only mining or agriculture, but also services, especially in, in a Latin, Latin American perspective. I, I think that Chile has a huge opportunity to develop more uh, export services, uh, uh, especially thinking in Latin American uh, markets. But Chile and also New Zealand needs the rest of the world for growth and development. So in, in our opinion, in my opinion spe specifically, Chile should continue to advance in the process of trade opening, deepening existing trade and free trade agreements and achieving new trade agreements where countries like India, but Asia in general seems to be a fundamental objective. So I think we need to continue with the process that we start in the 70s and continue du during the 90s um, because we need the rest of the world for growing. Um, I think we need to continue giving a step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herman. I pass the floor to Stephanie Honey. She is the Associate Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum. Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, in keeping with the, the the theme of 2020, I just had to move my cat out of the out of the uh, the, the screen. I'm sorry about that. Look, just in the last few minutes, um, I would like to take the opportunity to bring the threads together of this wonderful seminar, and, and thank you so much to all of these you know illustrious speakers for their great insights. Um, I guess uh, the, the perspective that I'm going to bring to, to drawing these threads together is one from the business community and, and drawing on my roles as the Associate Director of the New Zealand International Business Forum um, and the Policy Advisor to the New Zealand members of the APEC Business Advisory Council. And I think uh, as all of our speakers have highlighted today, we're obviously living in a fundamentally changed world. And that's something that um, you know, businesses and policymakers are, are really having to come to terms with. I think it's clear that we should not just be thinking about business as usual, but done via Zoom. We have to have a sort of fundamental rethink, if not a reset of some of our policy and business models to contend with this disruption. But fundamentally, we're still absolutely interconnected across the Pacific between New Zealand and Chile, but also around the world, um, as, as all of our speakers have noted. The fact is though, that it's not countries that trade, it's, it's people and businesses. And I think, you know, something that's a truism, but is also true, is that businesses don't really enjoy uncertainty and clearly COVID has turned everything on its head. Um, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why governments and, and businesses support the WTO and the global rules-based trading system. Um, I think we've also managed a good deal of resilience even through this disruption in New Zealand and Chile. And it's also true that, that with, with uncertainty and risk comes opportunity. But of course, in order to exploit those opportunities, we need to be sure that we face a level playing field. So from a business perspective, I think we're quite worried um, about the way countries are going to continue to respond to this uncertainty to COVID. The, as, as several of the speakers have highlighted, the risk of protectionism, economic nationalism, um, efforts from governments to reshore production or divert supply chains. So, you know, we need governments to be shoring up economies with stimulus programs, for example. Um, but we don't want to see a sort of a tilting of the level playing field. We need businesses to uh, governments to be supporting businesses and, and, you know, putting their business communities first but that shouldn't come at the expense of business in other countries. And of course, a really strong theme through all of this has been um, the need for you know, durable economic growth through inclusion and sustainability. So in ABAC, for example, we're very deeply concerned with achieving inclusive and sustainable growth. And that's going to be a really big focus for ABAC next year um, as, as New Zealand is in the chair women's economic empowerment and indigenous communities as well as small business. And we're very much looking forward to working with our, our excellent colleagues from Chile on that. Um, it's not just as our speakers have all talked about 
reinforcing the social license for trade. It's because it's the right thing to do. Um, we do need to tell the story of trade better, but we also need to have a better story to tell. And it's about creating the kind of societies that we want to live in. From a business perspective, obviously, it's also about realizing the full economic potential of our communities. And so for, for small businesses, for women-led businesses, that means you know, creating the right capacity and opportunity. To put it in trade policy terms, we need kind of fair rules, the ability to take advantage of the opportunities. So without having margins eroded by non-tariff barriers, for example, or trying to find our way through a tangle of conflicting trade rules. So that the work of governments and developing those trade agreements, as, as all of our speakers have talked about, is absolutely key. Other initiatives like the Southern Link, creating new opportunities and profile and so on and connectivity is really key. Um, and hand in hand with that, as, as Claire and uh, Vice, Vice uh, Chair uh, Yanez has talked about initiatives uh, at the domestic policy setting level about capacity building, networking, other ways to give a helping hand are key. Also, as many speakers have highlighted, digital transformation is absolutely fundamental to this. So it's fantastic the kind of thought leadership that, that New Zealand and Chile are showing through DEPA, through the WTO e-commerce plurilateral, through APEC, absolutely key to business um, as well as at the economy level. So COVID has, you know, the one silver lining we might say has been it's accelerated digital transformation. And, you know, from a New Zealand business perspective, it's been wonderful to see countries really turbocharging their efforts to facilitate trade digitally, so through the use of e-certificates and so on, I think the challenge now will be to lock that in as a sort of the future default, um, all that, uh, you know, digital trade facilitation, single windows, acceptance of e-signatures and digital identities, absolutely core to enabling businesses to save trade costs and make trade work, even if we face ongoing disruption through the pandemic. Services as well, um, obviously digital technology has a, a huge potential um, to enable services trade, which is after all the engine room of, of economic growth for many of us, to enable that to continue to function even when we have social distancing and disruption. Also though, the issue of the digital divide is very real. Even in a wealthy country like New Zealand, you know, we do see this paradox that a lot of our small businesses don't even have a website let alone being able to use the sort of potential of things like digital back office services or e-commerce platforms. So we really need to focus and double down on the ability of our businesses to use that. And finally, something that hasn't been, uh, you know, hugely a focus of this morning, but I think is absolutely critical to business around the region is the need for climate action. This is, you know, again, it's a little bit like gender inclusion or the inclusion for indigenous communities. It's the right thing to do, but it's also really starting to impact on business activities. So in ABAC, for example, this, this coming year, working on climate leadership from the business community is going to be a very key focus for us. For the New Zealand business community, it's a very strong aspiration and commitment. And I think, you know, something that's really positive about it is that business has a very key role to play here as the innovators in, in technology and solutions taking action directly, you know, business leadership through ESG investing or what we do in our own businesses, but also in making it clear to governments that this really fundamentally matters to us. So we want action and things like fossil fuel subsidy elimination, climate change mitigation measures, environmental goods and services, trade liberalization and so on. So, you know, there's a, a daunting agenda, but I think together we can really make a, a, a difference and create the kind of societies that we want to live in. So thanks so much to all the speakers. What a wonderful seminar this has been, touching on things that really matter to our societies and to business and uh, absolutely fascinating as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, Stephanie. And finally, Matthew, our colleague, to, to the closing remarks. Thank you, Jorge. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for those great remarks. You po pointed a way forward for a future agenda for future seminars that we can talk about. Um, I'd like to thank the, all the panelists for presenting today some really terrific insights. Jorge for moderating superbly. Um, 
everyone here who's participating in this event, we really hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have, and I think there's a lot of things we can talk about together. New Zealand and Chile have much we can share, many experiences. The relationship is close, but partial. We need to make it broader and, and bring the same degree of depth to the policy relationship to other facets of our engagement as well. So this has been a start. I think it's been a wonderful start. Thank you. It's been our privilege to, to work with the Centre for International Studies at the Catholic University, and we look forward to our future events and we'll inform you all about them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Matthew. Thank you all. Uh, have a good day or, 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 or good afternoon and see you soon. Bye-bye. Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.